Next, on Book TV's Afterwards, Ann Coulter makes the case for why Donald Trump should be president. She's in conversation with The Daily Caller's Tucker Carlson. So Ann Coulter, you are an author, you're a columnist, but you're also, and maybe primarily in the minds of most people, a TV person. People know you from television. And I think the assumption is that TV people don't write their own books. They have minions to do that. You're offended by this idea. You no, wrote I think this. it's an excellent assumption in pretty much every case but mine. And, and by the way, if you've turned on TV in the last year, you haven't seen me. No, Trump supporters you don't see too much of. Um, but yeah, I mean, I don't, first... Um, they're usually right, and I wish that were better understood. I've told New York Times reporters who mostly hate me, but I've always said to them, because, you know, they have the bestsellers list, fiction, nonfiction, paperback, hardcover. I want a separate section for authors who have written their own books. And that is <laughs> one thing every New York Times reporter agrees with me on, because they are at least writers. They may be, you know, Satanists, but they're writers. Um, and no, I mean, my second book, my, my editor called me and said, um, you know, congratulations, you're, you're on the bestseller list. And um, by the way, you're the only person on the list who wrote her own book. <laughs> <laughs> so how do, you, how, do you, how do you write your books? Well, what's the process of it? Um, usually I take a year off. This is, this is unusual. It's faster. I think Slander and Treason I may have done in back-to-back -back years, but that was, that was an emergency, and this is an emergency. Usually I take a year off, and I have, I, I, after I finish the book, I'm moving on from, for one thing I say, I'm never going to write another book. I've said that for every book Why since. Why do you say that? Because I, I thought I was done. It started with trees, and I thought, okay, that's everything I have to say. I've been wanting to write trees since I was in college. I wanted to write slander since, I don't know, sometime when I, about a year into reading New York Times. So probably when I was like 11, <laughs> I wanted to write slander. And then I thought, okay, that's everything I wanted to say. But then something comes along, and I think, oh, oh, I have to look this up. I'm interested in this. I mean, from Darwinism, McCarthyism, the French Revolution. And then... I have the thesis for the book, and I start reading, 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 reading to see if there's a point to the thesis. Um, and I th I've, I've dropped some ideas for books. In fact, that's how I ended up writing Adios America. That's not originally what it was going to be about. That was going to be one chapter. I'd already written a couple of chapters for that book. And it wasn't that it wasn't a good idea. I just found so much, so much more, this vast conspiracy to hide what's happening with immigration from the American people. So for a while, you know, I take some time off and I read and I formulate it and then I start writing and I'm completely cut off from the world. People who know me, um, every time I'm writing a book, and this is now my 12th, I will get an email from someone I've become friendly with recently. At some point in the, you know, like a month in, I'm sorry, have I done something to offend you? Are you mad at me? <laughs> <laughs> my friends who know me know that she's writing a book. Do not expect her to email so back. So you don't talk to anybody? Um, I have a couple of talking partners. Who are they? One of whom you know. <laughs> I cannot tell. <laughs> but, so what, what does that consist of? Do you, do you run your story ideas by them? Do you read chapters to them? Do you send them stuff that you're working on? Just chit-chat. Huh. That's really all it is. I'm trying to think, can I ever force... I mean, I guess there's the, there, there are about three. Um, and what a makes lot it, of it... What makes a good chit-chat partner when you're writing a book? Well, if I can maneuver the conversation around to something I'm writing about, unfortunately, with, with actually all of them, that's very difficult to do. I'll have to listen to, you know, 20 minutes on, you know, him calling the appliance rep repair man before I can work, it, work the conversation to whatever Trump said that day or, or whatever it is I want to talk about. But a lot of it is just talking ideas out when I can get to that part of the conversation. Um, and that's fun, and that gets me going. Um, do I ever get them to listen to me read portions of it? Um, that's way harder. Yeah. A lot of kicking and screaming, which really annoys me. <laughs> do you like the process of writing a book, or is it too solitary? Love it. You I do? I love it. I love it. In fact, people used to ask me, because I like doing TV t too, but, um, and radio, and I like giving speeches. Um, so I used to never be able to rem remember which do I like more, TV, writings, or which of these. And when I was writing, it was either demonic, I think it was demonic. I was so happy, happy every single day. I love the research. Also, I don't have to wake up to an alarm clock. I sleep until I wake up. I do whatever I want all day. And luckily, 
And this is why I think my books are fun, because I get bored easily. So I only read about stuff and write about stuff that's interesting. I mean, the French Revolution is really interesting. Yes, it and is. it's been hidden from us our entire lives. The lessons are too powerful. We can't handle it. <laughs> yes. yes. So it was totally fun. And it's not an assignment. Nobody's telling me you must write about the French Revolution. I just read all this fun stuff and find more fun stuff. And I love the research part of it. I loved tracking down how the media is hiding stuff on, not the, only the media, but the government, hiding true, true and important information from us about immigration. And obviously the Trump book, which is um, unusual in a few ways compared to my other books, but um, that was m most of that research was just watching Trump. <laughs> so you said this, you, you bang this out quickly. How yes. long did this take? Well, I had the idea in January, I was pretty sure Trump was going to be the nominee. Um, so, this January. Mm -hmm. wow. So started talking about it. I mean, definitely the January before, I probably thought of Trump what the Never Trumpers think of him now. Right. It wasn't until that Mexican rapist speech that he won my heart forever. Um, but still, the primaries were going on. And so even though I was talking about it with my agent, I forget when I was talking about it with publishers, but we, I had the idea and every or various people seem to like the idea. I couldn't really seriously force myself to start writing it until Cruz conceded, so whenever that was. So April-ish. Yeah, this is a fast turnaround, which so is why there, now are, August, some, there so are some errors in it. How long? There are, <laughs> we'll get to those. Uh, so how long did it take? Um, so then I turned it in, I don't know, a month ago? So April, whatever it was, May, June, July, and we're in August now. That actually seems like a long time, three months. Oh, I can do that on one hand. That's a lot of words in a day. So what's this book about? Um, I'm always the worst at describing what a book is about when I've just finished reading. In Trump, we trust. Do you e trust Trump? Pluribus awesome. E pluribus awesome. <laughs> no, I trust no one. But <laughs> <laughs> you trust no one. That's a good place to start. <laughs> but I do. I do think the things. Look, the things I trust him on are. Um, his basic philosophy of putting America first yes. on trade, on immigration, on wars. He has made so many mistakes. I mean, little mistakes. And he backtracks and he gets back on it. But when the entire media, the in and I mean the entire media, rose up to crush him after that Mexican rapist speech. I mean, I, I, it took me two weeks to believe he wasn't going to back down. In fact, I think it took me longer than that. I started emailing with Corey Lewandowski and every once in a while I'd I'd send a point, you know, you might want to mention X, Y, Z, but for probably six months, well, we can figure out how long it was, however many points I had, one of them would always be, don't let him back down on immigration. And I think it was after the Muslim ban, I finally said, okay, I think he's not backing down. <laughs> okay, probably not. now I believe you. Though now he appears to be a little bit. Not really. I mean, I'm annoyed, but it's a rhetorical thing. Um, I mean, I never th thought the deportation was going to be inhumane. Right. Um, he's almost responding to a media caricature. I wish he had just phrased it differently, not used the word softening, not had this drip, 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 and you know, driving his supporters crazy and allow allowing the media to go crazy. Um, and, and highlight this, we're getting a wall. ICE is going to be able to do its job. We're going to have a major cutback on Muslim immigration. And as for what's going to happen to, you know, the law abiding with the children, illegal immigrants, why doesn't he just say, uh, um, and by the way, everything I've just said is something that we would not get under any other president, not Jeb, not Rubio, not right. Walker. So, oh my gosh, we are eight, probably not Romney. We are eight million miles ahead of anything I ever imagined would happen in my lifetime, yes. even with that. But why doesn't he just say about what is going to happen with the illegals? The point is, no one has a right to be in this country illegally. And we as America will decide whether it's good for America, whether you stay or go. Maybe we'll want to keep you. But it will be determined on the basis of what is in this country's best interest. Not what is in the best interest of, of someone who is not an American. How do you think a statement like that would, would be received? Fine. How would the press interpret that? A softening. A softening. <laughs> a softening. There's so, but I mean, we've but been, what is it? About, I guess I want to get to the question of what is it? So you live in an affluent zip code. 
Okay. Right. And so presumably most of your neighbors are anti-Trump. A lot of the people you've known most of your life, you're from Connecticut, I'm sure, are anti-Trump. What is it about Trump that sets certain people on edge in the way that he does, do you think? Well, Washington is much worse than any other place. It's the most I mean, anti-Trump place in the oh world. Oh, yeah. my gosh. It's existential for Washington. Yes, that's it's like true. there's something in the water. Um, I know two non um, to two people who are not anti-Trump hysterics in Washington, and I suspect that, like George Ripper and Dr. Strangelove, they're drinking rainwater and grain alcohol because, whoa, there's something going on in this town. Um, but f- first of all, in, um, in two of the main cities I'm in, New York City and L.A., I'd say I have, um, of approximately 30 of my top-tier and second-tier friends, immediately all but one were 100 percent pro-Trump. And that's both in New York and L.A. And look, I, I, um, to paraphrase Donald Trump, I love the uneducated, but I'm not talking about uneducated people. I'm talking about lawyers, doctors, lots of doctors, um, comedy writers, producers, smart, highly, freakishly highly educated people, instantly pro-Trump. Only one in each city uh, was anti-Trump. In Washington, it was exactly the reverse. And then in in other fancy locales, well, I'll tell you, I spent Christmas in 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 Palm Beach and at Palm, at walking around at Christmas time. And we had seen the polls at that point. I kept I mean, I know some of the pro Trumpers, um, but yeah, that town was 100 percent. I would say more Jeb than Rubio. But the, the plutocrats were all wandering around shell shocked saying, um, I, I don't understand it. We were all for Jeb. The Hispanic help is all for Trump. <laughs> Interesting. So why do you, I mean, here you have the richest guy ever to run for president and rich people don't like him. What do you think that is? Well, I think it's less the rich than the, and I, I, I mean, my experience it does happen to be true. Admittedly, it's anecdotal. But I think the Washington versus Palm Beach, Beverly Hills, Manhattan actually tells us a lot that a lot of the rich people, well, there are two categories. We'll find out which ones are patriots and which ones just want the cheap labor and want to be locusts on America, eat it dry, and then move on to the next country. We're finding out right now. But I think some of them are, of the plutocrats are, are, are perfectly patriotic, lovely people. They want a Republican to win. They think that's better for the country. And they've just been snowed by campaign consultants who say, okay, we got to get, Jeb is our only shot. You got to give me a million dollars for Jeb. And, you know, they're busy. They're busy making millions of dollars. So, so they think, okay, I'll write a check for Jeb. Well, Trump has, Trump has, has shown the Wizard of Oz, <laughs> pulled back the curtain. Now they know, what am I wasting money on these idiots like Stuart Stevens and Mike Murphy for? They don't, they don't know their heads from a hole in the ground. So why does the press hate him so very much? Um, so here you have a candidate who says, and, and look, I, I think there are a lot of reasons to be concerned about Trump. All right. But here you have a candidate who at least says, you know, I'm here to represent the middle class people without a voice. I'm against a rigged system. And traditionally, you think of the press as being kind of a, a populist right. institution on behalf of the people against the powerful. That's what they tell themselves and the rest of us. And yet, almost to a person, they've come out against Trump in a, in a very assertive way. Why? Yes. What is that about? Part of it is what we were just describing, the, the, who benefits from not only illegal immigration, but a lot of low-wage legal immigration. Yes. Well, wealthy people do. They get cheap gardeners, cheap maids, and they don't, the, the gardeners and the maids don't live in their neighborhoods. They live out in the suburbs. Um, so it's those, it's other people's emergency rooms that are being, you know, bankrupted. It's other people's schools that can't have, um, you know, pageants anymore because they're spending all their money on English as a second language classes. Um, the media is part of that elite, which is just utterly self-centered, self-interested, forcing the middle class to subsidize their cheap labor. Um, but the other part of it is, and that's the political part, which is probably what drives them the most crazy, the left was just on the verge of total hegemony. Um, It started with Teddy Kennedy's 1965 Immigration Act. Um, Obama put it into overdrive. Clinton started to put it into overdrive. But, whoa, um, Obama left Clinton in the dust with all of the... Bush didn't slow it down much. Bush didn't slow it down, right. But with Obama, man, he's flying him in from Central America. 
Um, and putting them, I mean, it's, I, I think Daily Caller has written about it. I know I've read various, various articles about it. Putting, it, putting all of these third world immigrants in the states they need to flip blue. Right. So, you know, the, the long term plan of, of the Kennedy Democrats was, you know, over time we bring in a million immigrants a year, 90% from the third world, 80% vote for the Democrats, um, you know, 50 years. We'll have an unbeatable majority. Suddenly, they're looking at it next year. <laughs> they're about, right. they're on the ver, the cusp of winning, and along comes Trump, and says he's going to shut it down. So, if you were to narrow, so it sounds like you're making the argument that if you were n to narrow down what makes Trump so loathsome to the people in power, it's his opposition to immigration. And if you were to narrow down what makes him so appealing to others, it's his opposition to immigration. Oh yes. So this is about immigration. I think so. I mean, I love his trade policies. I love his no pointless wars in the Middle East. But I think immigration is the great unifier. Do you think that you'd feel, I mean, even factoring in the fact that you just wrote a book on immigration and you have it on the mind, do you think there's, there's evidence for that? That's what this is really about? Because you often hear people on television say, well, the exit polls don't, don't tell us that. Right. Don't suggest immigration is number one on people's priority list. Um, whenever they say that, I look at what people do say is their number one issue. And it's always things like jobs terrorism right <laughs> you know um cultural changes they're all synonyms for immigration and also i mean americans are nice people i think they have the sense especially with with the media telling them this that if they say it's immigration it's as if they're saying something mean about immigrants right. and they're nice people we like immigrants and as Trump always says, he loves Hispanics. That was my favorite tweet. I think it's the Hispanics, but yeah. That was my, fa of all the things he's done other than the Mexican rapist speech. You, you know. like the Taco Bowl tweet. Oh my gosh, that was so making fun of multiculturalism. It was hilarious. I screamed when I read it. I love Hispanics. <laughs> Having a Taco Bowl salad at the Trump Tower. <laughs> So, I mean, it sounds like you appreciate the performance art element to this campaign. I do. I do. I don't think that's why people are voting for him, but he is very funny. He is very politically incorrect. There's a big appeal to the political So, Ed, I mean, you know Trump, and you've been following this closely. To what percentage, would you, off the top of your head, would you say if his statements are ironic, sarcastic, designed for sh their shock value to amuse him? <laughs> um, like when uh, he says... You know, McCain got captured and he got a medal. There are a lot of people who didn't get captured wear their medals. Was that serious, do you think, or was he... Um, I, in fact, I write about it in, in the book at one point. I think that was, that was lied about. He was, he was angry and he was lashing out, and he deserved to be angry and lashing out. What, what, what I wrote about that as well as the attack on the disabled reporter. I wouldn't say either of them, um, either of them were ironic or sarcastic, but I think he was, I think they were both lied about, and I think he was justified in both cases. And to take the McCain case, uh, uh, I mean, uh, these poor Arizonans, they have been so overwhelmed with illegal immigration, with, you know, uh, girls being raped, cattle being slaughtered, their fences knocked down. They've just been overwhelmed with illegal immigration, begging the federal government to do something. The federal government will not do anything. Um, they had that famous, you know, what, as the media called it, the Papers, Please law, which required what has been required of immigrants since 1940. So I guess we've been living in a Nazi state since 1940. Immigrants are required to carry their papers on them. So that was required for Arizona. It was all, it was attacked by all the Bush, all the Bush people as unconstitutional and so outrageous that if... The law was um, um, an Arizona state trooper or policeman, if they're in the process of arresting someone, if they suspect him to be an illegal alien, may ask for his immigration papers. Right. Um, and, oh, my gosh, do you remember how that was denounced for a high and low? Um, it was up upheld by the Supreme Court. You ever get the footnote on whatever happened with that? that Lindsey Graham, you know, the big, big constitutional scholar, Lindsey Graham, called unconstitutional. No, of course it was upheld as, as constitutional. It was written by Chris Kobach. It was constitutional. Um, after all that, all the sneering, Trump goes to do his first event after the Mexican rapist speech in Arizona. They have to shut down the first venue. It was going to be at the hotel. Too many people are coming. There are like 20,000 people. They have to rent a stadium. And, and the day after it happens, or maybe the day it was happening, Trump goes to the New Yorker so he can call them crazies. 
The American people who showed up at the Trump rally. McCain went to the New Yorker. McCain went to the New Yorker to call these lovely Americans concerned about illegal immigration, to call them crazies. And that's what Trump was angry about. He called, he called McCain a dummy, said he graduated second from his class from Annapolis. And then when he was being interviewed by Frank Luntz, um, or wherever. By um, Frank Luntz, the pollster, yep. Yeah. Frank Luntz, you know, raises with, with Donald Trump. Now, is that presidential to call Senator John McCain a, a, a dummy? He's a war hero. And so Trump starts to explain what I was just explaining. Look, I'm having this event, and he goes and he calls these people crazies. And he said the full, I reprint the full thing Trump said, because he said, I know crazy. These people were not crazy. They're lovely, decent Americans. Um, and in the middle of Trump explaining this, Luntz interrupts him to say, but he's a war hero. He's a war hero. And that's, what, that's when Trump said, oh, he's not a war hero. We got captured. I like people who weren't captured. Oh, well, perhaps he was a war hero, but, and then goes on. So it was just a, a flash of anger. And again, it wasn't, well, not again, because I haven't told you yet, but it's in the book. When Trump attacks, he attacks the powerful on behalf of decent, long-suffering Americans who are ridiculed and sneered at in the media all the time. He was attacking on behalf of these nice Americans who were called crazy by right. John McCain. And look, he took it back in the next sentence. So McCain's a senior senator, powerful. Hard to say that about the Khan family, powerful. Um, fair point, but I think um, it's about time Democrats put an end to this human shield practice of sending out sad victims to present their policy proposals. This is a serious issue. This isn't, they weren't standing out there just to say we're a Muslim family. Right. Um, I want to honor my son here. He was being sent out to claim to the American people that our constitution requires us to keep dumping more and more Muslim immigrants on the country. Well, I think, I think Americans have a right to dispute that. And if you're going to send out someone we're not allowed to respond to, <laughs> that kind of shuts the debate down. But this is what the left always does. This is what I wrote about in Godless with the Jersey girls. Um, you know, they have all these policy proposals and you, you, you know, you attack them and, <gasps> but their husbands died in 9-11. Well, I have an idea. Why don't you have somebody else make the argument then? Send out Hillary Clinton to make the argument. Send out Tim Kaine to make the argument. Don't send out an angry Muslim we are not allowed to respond to waving our constitution at us and claiming absurdly it requires us to keep admitting Muslim immigrants. I mean, we have been, I think most Americans do not know this, we've admitted more Muslim immigrants after 9-11 than before 9-11. Well, of course, of course, you knew that was going to happen. We admit it more Muslim immigrants or more immigrants, well, more immigrants from Muslim countries than immigrants from the entire British Isles. Yes. After San Bernardino, Boston Marathon, 9-11 itself, Orlando. This is an important public policy that I think Americans have a right to discuss. And, you know, Democrats are going to find some orphan to send out their argument because, oh, you can't respond. So to what extent does the average American have any influence over our immigration policy? Well, a lot this November. <laughs> Do you this think, is it. Is there polling on this? Is there polling on the level of knowledge the average person had about who's coming in and in what numbers before this election? Um, it's a lot more prominent now. Thank you, Donald Trump. I don't ever, I don't remember this being a, Never. a, a public debate. No, no. Huh. And in fact, in my book, I, um, I cite Trump's very first interview after the Mexican rapist speech with uh, Bill O'Reilly. First question, ISIS. What are you going to do about ISIS? And then he went through Syria, Iran, um, you know, the Muslim Brotherhood, we probably got into Russia and the Ukraine. Not one question on immigration. One month later, Trump or uh, O'Reilly is introducing Trump saying illegal immigration is not being dealt with in this country. And that in part is what shot, has shot Donald Trump to the top of the polls. Here he is in Alabama with 20,000 people coming to his rally. So if you care about this issue, and you obviously do and you know a lot about it, aren't you concerned that Trump whose instincts and impulses you agree with, but who's got to be on the low end of the articulate scale on this question, <laughs> might wind up discrediting the ideas that you care so much about. Um, I was worried about that at first. Um, but no, I mean, you take the rough with the smooth. 
he he has this boisterous bragging personality that attracts a lot of people. People start listening because they want to be entertained, and he's very entertaining. Yes. And you're listening to him when he, I mean, people are driving probably at first, you know, five and six hours to go hear him. Probably a lot of them weren't going because they thought he believes everything I've always wanted. Right. I want to make him president. They were going, at, some of them, at least in part. I mean, I think probably a lot of them like the Mexican rapist speech as much as I did. Um, but but some of them were just going because they knew he was really entertaining. But then you're there and you hear him. You're laughing. You're having a good time. Right. It's funnier than listening to a stand-up comedian a lot of the time. And then it hits you. Wait, I agree with this guy. He's making some good points. I, and I think that's clearly happened on a pretty big scale. The question is if he loses what happens. So the victors write the histories, right. the losers write the unread memoirs. <laughs> and so as in Prop 187 in California, you know, 20 years later, people have a completely distorted view of what actually happened. So if Trump loses, won't the message from everyone in Washington, Republican and Democrat, be, see, this is what happens when you run on immigration. It's a hateful subject inherently. Never do that again. Shut up and obey. I don't think so, and I don't think it will matter because, and I'll get to the I don't think so point first, or second. Um, if Trump loses, the country's finished. What you do, what I do, Fox News, talk radio, it's, I mean, I guess you can still do your campus stuff, but the country's finished. The country Why becomes California that? because Hillary has said she's granting amnesty to, it's not 11 million, it's at least 30, probably 40 million, maybe as many as 50 or 60 million illegal aliens. She's going number? to grant them, well, it's in my last book, Adios America. Right, but for those who haven't read it, explain how that we've works. We've been saying 11 million, for one thing, you should be suspicious when we've been hearing 11 million for more than a decade now. How can that be? We haven't gotten one more illegal alien. And uh, all of the estimates that say 11 million are based on the census, which asks people, um, are you here legally? And many people thought that perhaps having, you know, struggled across the de desert, risked death, um, broken many laws, stolen ID to get here, illegal immigrants might not be filling out government surveys accurately. So first, some Bear Stearns analysts who are advising people about something important, their money, um, they said this is insane. We can't trust any of these. And all the groups come to the same 11 million because they're all using the census report. So they're starting with the same bad right. input. So what the two Bear Stearns analysts looked at um, were, well, a lot of things, but two of the big ones were remittances of money back to Mexico. Yes. And they went to, looked at illegal alien hotspots where it's known that there are illegal aliens, certain towns in New Jersey and other places, and looked at school enrollments and housing permits, among other things. But it was a massive, intensive study, and on the basis of that, they determined, I think it was 20 million, and this was more than a decade ago. And then there are these two, um, I think it's Bartlett and Steele, these two famous investigative reporters. They've won Pulitzer Prizes for the Vanity Philadelphia Fair, Inquiry, Time yeah. Magazine. Um, they spent a year investigating illegal immigration, also a decade ago, about a year after the Bear Stearns report. They were down at the border. They were interviewing people, you know, Border Patrol, this, that, the other thing. One year they spent doing this, and they estimated that 3 million illegal aliens were com coming in per year. So if you start with the 20 million, and then you assume it's... Only a third of that three million were coming in for the next ten years. We're already at thirty million. Wow, it's it's very and and then so we're, that we're getting we're hovering a little less than ten percent of the population at that point. Oh yes, and it may seem strange in 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 the Northeast. That does not seem strange at all in the Southwest. Okay, so I interrupt you. So the, the first reason that so you, you get, say the country will not recover is because of immigration and legalization of people here illegally. Yeah, that's it. That's democracy committing suicide. Hillary wants to more than quadruple the number of Muslim refugees. And I mean, I think a lot of conservative media think, oh, that's great. If Hillary's elected, we're going to make more money. Well, no, if you can't win a game anymore, but ask people how interested they are in, you know, local Los Angeles politics. Yeah. <laughs> Not that interesting Not very, anymore. Right. Um, when all you do is lose, 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 and lose. Um, so I, I, do, I do think the country is over, and I'm sorry for those of you with children or those of you who need jobs or those of you who came here because you wanted to live in America because it's going to be over. John Adams said all democracies commit suicide, and if Hillary is elected, it's this democracy committing suicide. I don't think there's any point in politics. I'll start writing mysteries. Um, so what does the country become at that point? Brazil. Huh. With the Tower small of Babel, California. 
What will happen is the president of Indonesia said this in an interview, I think with the Financial Times about a decade ago. Um, it's a somewhat famous quote among um, the immigration um, restrictionists like myself. Um, I forget his name, but it was a famous quote he said, was describing, I don't know, why he had blocked immigration to, I think it was, in, maybe it was Singapore. In any event, he said, what happens in a multicultural society is not, people don't, you know, split off and, break, and vote by, by political party, they vote by ethnic group. And that's what's happening in California. It's not Nancy Pelosi Democrats versus Chuck Rangel Democrats. It's, uh, um, it's Hispanic Democrats voting against the Asian Democrats. Suddenly it becomes very, very, very racialized. Right. Um, and it's, I mean, it's sad because there has never been as magnificent a country as America. And we can assimilate anyone, but not in the numbers we're taking them in. And why are we taking them in in such numbers? Why aren't we even trying to assimilate them? Because it's about cheap labor for the plutocrats and it's for the about the votes for for the democrats so it, it as you know after the last presidential election there was a post-mortem ordered by the republican national committee um and one of the maybe the central conclusion was the republican party needs to become more competitive among these emergent groups and broaden its appeal and there's great bitterness on the part of the republican establishment as you know that instead of doing that we got donald trump how do you right. respond um they're idiots, and the faster they are thrown out of the party, the better. I mean, this is the great thing Trump did. It's he did addition by subtraction, get rid of the of these moron consultants. I really think. I mean, Republicans. Wait, but why is that idea crazy? So uh, if I mean, this law has been in place yeah, for fifty years, as you said, the sixty-five yeah. uh, Immigration Act. So like. The country is demographically very different from what it was 50 years ago. Right. If you're one of the two main political parties, why wouldn't you in- try to increase your appeal to new Well, I don't think they, they are increasing their appeal. I think Trump is increasing the appeal to, to Hispanics and to African Americans. The problem is they are idiots, and their idea is um, we'll do, be just like the Democrats, but offer them not as much. So, so we'll give you amnesty, but you can't have citizenship or, you know, and we'll have a affirmative action for people we should never be having affirmative action. Affirmative action is to make up for slavery and Jim Crow. It's not just because you're not an American. And now, you know, Harvard is filling its, its quotas um, with, with, with foreigners, with, you know, the children of foreign, foreign diplomats, dictators, <laughs> warlords. That's how they... The, African Americans are losing out to those people, not just white Americans. It's madness that we have affirmative action and set asides and all. But isn't this. diversity our strength? <laughs> yeah. Yes, it's it's that's what uh, what's his name, General Hayden said after after no, it was um, it was uh, the general after the Fort Hood shooting said the real tragedy in all this would be if 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 we gave up our diversity. Well, the real tragedy might be if you got shot, actually, wouldn't it be? <laughs> this is how the, the Marxist march through our institutions has been so successful. So you reject, just to get back to my original question, right. you reject that premise itself, that the Republican Party, in order to m- maintain the status as one of the two main parties, needs to appeal. Not quite. Least- I think Trump is doing it in a way idiot Republicans, in my, my ex-Republican Party, not the new new, fresh, Trumpian Republican Party. Trump is doing it by saying, I'm going to bring jobs back. Yes. What, what, I, what I hated about my old Republican Party, and I've never seen it so clearly as with Trump, is what, they should not be acknowledging this ident- ethnic identity politics. Why, why should they acknowledge La Raza? Um, and, you know, oh, I'm going to speak to you as Chinese people and as Hmong people and, and Korean people. No, you're, they're Americans. They're happy. They like America. They came here. Bring the jobs back. That's the great unifier. They'd like a little less competition from all new cheap labor coming in. And that's why I liked Trump's um, um, Taco Bowl tweet. He was just making fun of the whole identifying people as ethnic groups. So... That's interesting that you say that. So what do you think when Trump does that? When Trump says the Hispanics love me, you know, the African-American voters love me. Is he playing the same game or is he doing it? No, I think I think African-American voters do love him. Um, And I think he should keep bragging about it. And I think he should. Well, the the poll we keep repeating and perhaps, you know, something I don't, but (laughs) has him at one percent in a poll with a margin of error of three. So it's possible that at least two percent of people are pretending to be African-American just so they can hate Trump in the poll. That seems pretty low. 
it does seem low, I admit. However, um, I won't be a nut and say I don't believe the polls, but I don't believe this poll. I just think, look, either the black turnout will be down or I think Trump will get more of the black vote than any Republican since Richard Nixon, which, OK, admittedly isn't all that much. But um, I think he does have an appeal and it's on the issue of immigration. Yes. That's, <laughs> I mean, they keep attacking Trump. If they're going to keep calling him racist because he says we don't want to keep bringing in illegal immigrants to take jobs from our native born. I'm sorry. I think a lot of blacks are saying damn right. Right. If your family's been here 400 years and you're being replaced by yeah. people who the elites favor over you, I think you have cause for yeah. concern. So here's what's so interesting. You're describing a Republican Party that's been transformed not just practically, but ideologically by this man, Donald Trump. Like, it's just, it believes different things from what it believed six months ago. Which Fair? I didn't realize that it didn't believe six months ago. They've been fooling me. <laughs> they didn't fool me. <laughs> but here's the, here's, here's the question, and I don't know the answer to it. Perhaps you do. Why hasn't Trump spawned Trumpism? Why aren't there? There are a lot of people who like Trump. But there are very few people around him kind of building the intellectual framework for a new political movement. In well, contrast to, say, I, don't, I mean, famously Goldwater, who lost by this massive margin well, in 64. Well, I don't think Trump is going to lose, so we'll see but what le happens. Leaving that aside, but I'm saying there are a lot of people right. who not just aped Goldwater's style, but also thought deeply about what he said he represented and then wrote books about it and... It, where are those people? No, I think this that cycle? that not only does exist, and that was to your next question. I mean, I do think the country's over. So, I, if Trump doesn't win, so it's kind of pointless to talk about. But no, I don't think the ideas will be discredited manifestly. I mean, when you have Paul Ryan coming out against the Trans-Pacific Partnership the day before his primary, after just getting a standing ovation right. from the Koch brothers, saying, "Don't worry, we're going to push this through," um, I think. I think politicians realize it's what they're pushing isn't popular. When you have Hillary being protested at her own convention, and God bless those Sanders supporters. I must say, I've never seen leftist hecklers whom I didn't think were morons. And it wasn't just because they were protesting Hillary. When they were interviewed afterwards on MSNBC, they were actually really articulate and giving real reasons. Yes. They said, she doesn't help the working class. I'm working class. Sanders helps the working class. Two of them talked about the Trans-Pacific Partnership right. and how it's sending jobs abroad. That's a real reason. It's not just, you know, I hate the rich. And kind of sweet and sincere people based on my... Yeah. Extensive dealings with the rallies. No, totally nice. You know, no one's giving you the finger. So they kind of want have, to convince you. And now we have Hillary pretending she opposes the TPP. Now right. they're lying. I don't know how much this counts, but at least politicians are acknowledging what's popular when they know what they need to lie to the voters about. That's a good point. But why isn't there? I mean, you would think that a massive change shakes a political party really to its foundations, that you would see this wave of magazine pieces and books. We have yours. <laughs> but where are the others explaining what this means? And do you fear that some people, maybe including you, are reading into Trump ideas that they want to see there when perhaps that's not what he means? No, not on the latter point. I mean, just because he has been a businessman his whole life. And by the way, what's happening this week with the softening? I mean, we've been through this a million times before. In the middle of a de debate, he came out for H-1B visa workers. Right. <laughs> My internet blew up. And then, you know, the next day he issues another statement. We know, I mean, as... But I Reagan wouldn't have come out in the middle of a debate and said, you know what, maybe, you know, Russian ICBMs in Cuba is not a big deal. <laughs> Because like he knew They're at least on, on his people. but on his core issue he knew what he thought in a pretty unassailable way. Like you can wake Reagan up from a dead sleep and ask him about That's the Soviets, true. and he knew what he thought. That's true, but I think you could. They have different advantages and different disadvantages. Um, Trump has not been in the world of ideas. Reagan was in the world yes, of ideas right. for a long time. So it is true you could wake him up in a dead sleep and he would know the details. You can wake Trump up in the middle of a dead sleep and he knows whose side he's on. He's on the American middle class side, the America working class. He has That is one thing that his life is shot through with. He has always been for the working class. He has always been against these trade deals. It's actually somewhat more recently that he figured out how immigration, though before the campaign began, that he figured out how immigration, dumping low-wage workers, was hurting the middle class. Where his heart is, is absolutely solid, and you could totally throw a glass on him in the middle of the night, and he will say, no, American boys shouldn't be dying for another war in the Middle East right now. Um, no, we should be renegotiating for years. I bet he was better on the trade deals than Reagan was, even. Was that a tough one for you to swallow, the anti-Iraq war stuff from Trump? Well, no, 
because, and I've talked, I mean, as you, for those of you who don't know, um, no, I was a bigger Iraq war supporter than Donald Rumsfeld was. Yes. <laughs> and uh, look, personally, I stand by it. I think it was, I, 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 I had a few friends. Most of my friends agreed with me. We didn't have these individual terrorist attacks back then. I mean, it's really kicked up since we haven't been there. Um, I do think it was important for a lot of reasons. I always thought the weapons of mass destruction was the last of the reasons. That was just to taunt liberals with. It was because Saddam, well, he's sitting on all this oil. He conspired. He sheltered terrorists. The terrorists from um, the first World Trade Center, they, did, they get away. Where do they end up? In Iraq. Um, he's funding suicide bombers, the families of suicide bombers. Obviously not the suicide bombers. <laughs> the families of suicide bombers. Um, I think he was trying to get weapons of mass destruction. I mean, we found that um, not stockpiles, but um, he attempted to assassinate a former president of the United States. And it was a very educated populace led by a crazy leader. When In the Arab world, it's always one or the other. Um, either you have a crazy leader with basically sane people or you have um, a sane leader with insane people. With a, you, you want to go for the ones where the people are basically pro-Western and educated and literate, who have a sane leader, knock their leaders out. You ought right. to be able to establish a democracy. Well, that was a rock, and they were waving their purple fingers, and it was great. But then we, I put the blame on uh, Barack Obama for sing, pulling out every single last troop. You couldn't leave a few troops. No, he had to turn our victory into a defeat. But having said that, whether I'm right or the people who say this was always doomed to failure are right. Including Donald Trump. Including Donald Trump, including some of my friends, including Chris Matthews. At this point, who would do it again? Who, I mean, that's water under the bridge. We can argue about whether it was always doomed to failure or whether it was Obama's fault from now until the end of time. Look at what has happened since then. But we can't argue that it's not a failure. Correct. Right. And, we can, and why would you do it again? And yet, all these people I thought were my allies in the Iraq war, not any of my friends. I've been asking my friends at dinner um, for a few months now. And all of us, I mean, I, I think one or two of my friends were against the Iraq war from the beginning because they said they're ungrateful swine <laughs> and it will inevitably be a disaster. Yes. There's no point to this. Okay, perhaps they had a point. But, or maybe I'm right. Whatever. Well, that's a moot <laughs> point. We're leaving it aside. <laughs> and so your position is that's open for debate? So. That's open for debate. Okay. Going forward, none of my friends would do it again and we're all sitting looking at these at these crazed warmongers and thinking, wait, everything they were accusing us of that we used to laugh about our allies actually are those people. They just want the country to be constantly at war. And part of it is the same thing with the, with the campaign consultants. It's the only game they know. Right. Nobody cares about their opinion unless we're at war, so they always want us to be at war. So Trump wins. What happens? Oh, life will be grand. But will it be? I mean, will, look, the people who, this is my read, the people who oppose Trump don't simply oppose him on the issues or on his temperament, but they oppose him on the grounds that he is a threat to the country, that he's evil, that he's a bad person, and that his election will be, in effect, uh, you know, a fascist takeover, an authoritarian takeover of, of the country. No, sincerely. And I think a lot of people feel that way. So will those people, could those people ever accept him as the legitimate president? Well, another moot point is whether they really believe that this is going to be a fascist takeover or if they're just hysterical because they're losing No, I think power. it's a central point. Do you think they believe that? I don't think they believe it. I think they know they're losing their power. They're going to have to do what Marco Rubio tells the poor out of work, you know, steel worker. Improve your education. <laughs> Go back to school. Yeah, well, maybe can, can political consultants should do that because we don't need them anymore. We don't need all these pollsters. We don't need the phony conservative media. Go back to school. Marco Rubio has a plan to help you further your education. You're just going to have to adapt, adopt, or, or adapt rather, the way they are always telling these poor, out of work, blue collar workers. You, you have to adapt, adapt to the changing economy. So adapt to the changing economy, Washington. Um, I don't. I, I mean, it's crazy. They're, so you're not. So you're not concerned if Trump were to get elected that you would see like an actual fracture in the country where people just said, you know what, I'm not. I'm, we're not acknowledging his authority, whatever that means. Um, they'll be hysterical and I'll enjoy it. Do you think Trump is capable of bringing some of those people over or calming well, their fears? Does if, he need to? I mean, if they're going to go around saying he's Adolf Hitler and a fascist, I think, 
I think at some point they may have to see he's not Adolf Hitler right. and he's not a fascist. And I think it's going to be great because he will neg renegotiate trade deals. I so want manufacturing to come back to this country. I really think this is... It's, it's really, it's awful what has been done in the name of this religion of free trade. We used to have, you know, 20 million manufacturing jobs in America, not that long ago, in the 80s. We're down to 11 million on a much larger population. We don't make anything in this country anymore. Think of all the jobs the wall is going to create. Rebuilding infrastructure. If Trump does nothing but renegotiate trade deals, build a wall, put, um, you know, let ICE do its job... Um, pretty, pretty severe damper on, on more Muslim immigration here. He will be the greatest president since George Washington. If he does nothing else, nothing else, well, I'd like him to get rid of Obamacare. <laughs> do you think he's cap I mean, do you think he's interested in running the country? Yes. Okay, so it's not simply about winning. No. No, no, I don't you think, think he, think he done wants this. to govern. I think he is a genuine patriot, genuinely loves the country. And I think he looked around and saw, uh, saw so many things going wrong that he can fix. I mean, if in that opening speech, um, he said something to the effect of, you know, if we don't stop this now, it's going to be too late yes. soon. It's going to be unsalvageable. And I don't think he said this, but I'll say this. He can fix it. And the rest of them can't. I mean, just to get back to America for Americans. Right. And then we can fight about everything else. I don't know if you noticed, I dedicated the book to Mickey Gauss, Democrat. I did, I did notice, yes. Um, because I think this is the first time, and I, he better, or, uh, oh, oh, I'm taking that dedication back. But I think this is the first time in his life he will vote Republican. And uh, I, we went to a party when I was out in L.A. about a month ago, um, down in Laguna Beach, and there were all these nice Republicans. Um, and they came up and they knew I was bringing Mickey and th they said to me, you know, we looked up this Mickey Cowson. He's a liberal Democrat. <laughs> and I said, yes, yes, but he's with us on immigration. First we save America, then we'll argue with him about Obamacare. Sounds like your politics have changed. Um, I know you don't like to admit that, but look, everything is changing in America at pretty high speed. Trump has changed a lot. How do you think your personal views? Are, like, what have you re-examined? The main in thing the past is, six and you very probably correctly and cynically said, "No, you always knew the Republican Party was lying to us." I thought they really did care about the working class and the middle class, and not just the donors of yeah. the business roundtable. Boy, has Trump flushed them out! Yeah. I mean, I think the Republican Party was much better in a way. This is there are two th bad things unintentionally Ronald Reagan did to the country. One was the first amnesty, although, haha, <laughs> can we learn our lesson from that? But number two was, when I was a kid, um, I guess when I was in law school, this was after Reagan was president, but a lot of us were, come, we were all as kids for Reagan. Um, and so a lot of young people, young right wingers, suddenly came to Washington after Reagan, or I guess during Reagan, and there was all this young blood in Washington. And it seemed like it was gonna be a great thing because it used to be that the permanent bureaucracy, the permanent, you know, think tanks, everyone in the city was liberal Democrat. Right. And then Republicans would come in with their, you know, thousand people working in the executive branch, but everyone else in the city working against them. So it was great that you'd have all these right wingers like Heritage Foundation and AEI and Cato and, and just people who have and and um, Washington Times. Um, but I think that has turned out to be a curse. Why? Because I think they, they have, it has become an end in itself, the organization, the party, the territorial Republican Party. It's, it's well, but is that really fair? I mean, we have all these conservative think tanks in Washington consuming billions of dollars over decades. And the net result is a country that's much more conservative than it was in the Oh, wait. No, I guess maybe, <laughs> no, maybe you do have a point. Okay, so you think... <laughs> Because they have a structural incentive to keep things exactly the same. And they need the donor money. Yeah. No, it's a, it's a, it's a fair point. So you, Reagan brought you know, thousands of young people to Washington. If Trump wins, will he, is it conceivable he would do that? At least we know they'll all go home. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, it's, it's okay that no one new will come, but a lot of old people will leave. Is that what you're saying? Hopefully, yeah. This, this is your addition by subtraction? Yes. That just... <laughs> it's, it's hilarious. So when Trump said the other day, if I don't win, it's okay, 
because I'm rich and I have lots of other hobbies and interests and I'm going to go on a long vacation. Did it occur to you that maybe that was might be offensive to people who are you know sincerely concerned about a Hillary presidency who watched him mow down 16 other contenders for the job, get the job, and then kind of explain, yeah, I don't really need this job. I mean, no, did it suggest I don't maybe he's not so. as all in as no, I think as he he's needs to be? oh, I think he's he wants to be president. He wants to save the country, okay. and we've been hearing that from the beginning. It's weird this thing the press has been saying, and and it shows you the power of propaganda and the power of the press. I, I mean, just a month ago, I had. Um, a friend of a friend say to me completely seriously, do you think he really wants to be president? Yes. yes! <laughs> oh my gosh, he's given up. Well, at this point, probably over time, hundreds of millions of dollars. Um, he works harder than any human I've ever seen. I mean, maybe this would be fun for a few weeks, but yeah, he wants to be president. He wants to fix the country. I think the one thing that really does run through Donald Trump's life is absolute patriotism um, and love for this country. Um, and that's why, you know, I'm not worried about the details. He has Stephen Miller. What about Stephen Miller? <laughs> was one of his chief, I think the chief uh, policy advisor to him, formerly from Senator Sessions' office. Has this affected your friendships? Um, I think I've only lost one friend, but... Um, what happened? Well, it, he happened to be a friend that all of my other friends hated, so it was kind of a relief. It was? <laughs> it ended this problem we had. <laughs> Why did, what happened to the friendship? After Cruz withdrew, he um, sent me a snippy ma email asking me not to email him again. Because he was so for Cruz and you weren't? And, and he's an hysterical anti-Trumper. Huh. Why? I don't know. I do not know. But it was, it's weird. I, I do not know. I think he's kind of a party man, which is weird because he's not a consultant, a pollster, blah, blah, blah. But sometimes people can get their heels in. And I mean, that's an unfortunate thing that's happened. That's happened this time around. I don't know if you remember. I remember because I was a big fan of Romney's. He was the best yes. on immigration until, <laughs> until Trump came along. Um, and he was an elegant person. And, and I think the best candidate we've run since Reagan until Trump. Um, but as people lost to Romney in the, that primary in yes. 2012, none of them endorsed Romney. No, that's true. He was despised. Bitterly. By they would attack him on the way out. Rick Perry, or even Herman Cain. Right. Um, all of them, as Newt Gingrich, as they dropped out, they would endorse anybody but Mitt Romney. Right. So there, and, and, oh, for Pete's sake, it's Romney, the most lovely, sweet, <laughs> elegant person. If they're going to be mad at him, imagine how they feel about, about Trump. But he Plus, wasn't regarded that way by people who knew him well. Nor is Trump. Right. No, but I'm, I'm, I'm merely saying Romney, it seemed to me, was very much like Cruz this cycle, where all the other candidates disliked him as a person, I noticed. I think it's, well, the, most of the bitterness is directed toward Trump. I think Cruz, that's kind of a different thing. Every place he's ever gone, he's disliked. Since kindergarten, the mm. Senate, every place he goes. We keep reading about it, and now we see why. Why hasn't Trump given an immigration speech yet? Why not explain precisely what he thinks to the public and put a lot of the fears of his supporters at rest, maybe affirm the fears of his opponents. <laughs> I mean, why, why not just, because, I mean, isn't a speech the perfect way, and traditionally always has been the way for candidates to tell you what they really think? You know, you can't misinterpret it. You read it off a prompter. Well, he's given some immigration speeches. But the immigration speech. You know, here's, here's, here's what I would do if elected. Wouldn't that be He helpful? has an immigration policy paper. He's talked a lot about it. The issue is he had one scheduled. Yes. And now it's been unscheduled. And they've been drib drib dribbing this thing about softening, um, which is driving his supporters out of their minds. I mean, it's just, how many transgenders do you think there are in America? A thousand? Over a dozen, fewer than a hundred. Okay, know, I fine. Know. Let's say let's let's estimate up and say five hundred. Okay. There are more transgenders in America than there are Americans worried about the comfort and feeling of security of people who have entered our country illegally. Why are we spending any time discussing this? Good question. Why not Buick making cars in China now? Buick. Why not H one B workers? These, these are taking white-collar jobs. These are taking your kids' jobs. It's not just taking your nanny's job anymore. How about a little time on that? Well, one of the reasons, perhaps, is because 
Trump continues the conversation and responds to every question posed to him and relentlessly turns the conversation back to himself. And so if you're Hillary Clinton <laughs> and you don't want to run a campaign on what you believe or what you might do right. or whom you've taken money from, you want to run a campaign that's a referendum on Donald Trump's character. And so if you're Donald Trump, why would you continue to keep that conversation alive? What do you mean? Why would you help Hillary Clinton by talking about yourself? Why wouldn't you turn it back to the issues? Oh, why time isn't again? he simply talking about That's her right. corruption? That's exactly right. Or, or about what he believes and saying, you know what? If I'm elected, this is what America will look like. Yeah. And, you know, my ties are made in China, whatever. That's not the point. The point is, if elected, everyone else's ties will be made here. Or whatever. No, that's exactly right. Do you but know what percentage of clothes is made in, that we buy in America are made no. in America? It's like 3%. Right. I, I believe it. 3%. And they have to get... No, that's the whole point with the, the ties being made in China is such a stupid point. No, he wants to change it so that you can, so that your ties will be made here. So if you're, you follow this stuff as closely as anybody and you're clearly, you have a lot of emotional skin in this game. So when you watch Trump on television and you think he goes off message, and I'm sure you feel that way. Do you call him? Do you call people on his campaign? No, I tweet. You tweet? You tweet? <laughs> Do you think he listens? Um, I'm not saying necessarily to me, oh, but, but to, to people yes, like you? I think he totally listens to criticism. And I think he, I mean, we've seen it over and over again where he will make a mistake and, and then switch course. And sometimes a full-fledged clarification, like after the H-1B thing yeah. he said at one of the debates. Um, no, he absolutely listens to people. And, he, and he's a quick study. He's obviously very smart. Um, he's going in the direction we want to go in. I, I mean, one of the things I make fun of the media for is, and, because I think it's just a time filler, they kept attacking him for no policy specifics, no policy specifics. Right. And um, one thing I learned from, from my longest editor was he said the way he used to edit me was to unexample me. I'm a lawyer, so I like to make a statement and then have like 20 examples, and he'd say, and give three and move on. I'm just going to cut the, the, uh, the other 17 examples out. So I usually don't, but I got to this chapter and I thought, ah, screw it. You're getting 50 examples, reader. I don't care if you want them or not. <laughs> uh, and it's all this no policy specifics, which I interspersed with, you know, and another major policy speech given by Donald Trump. And then he had a 20 page policy paper saying X, Y, Z, but apparently no one in the media could get a hold of an internet modem, which would allow them to read his policy speech. But uh, I, it gets to the point that it's like they're saying, um, you know, JFK, I want to go to the moon. Media, what's your policy on going to the moon? <laughs> Do you have any policy specifics? No, the direction is what right. we want. He's saying he's going to go in that direction. Exactly. It's, it's the same thing with the Muslim ban. I understood the first time he said um, we have to ban um, or suspend, temporarily suspend Muslim immigration until we can figure out what the hell is going on. I understood that immediately, and I didn't take it the additional 17 steps that many in the media did. Does that mean we have to ban King Abdullah of Jordan? No, there will be a general rule, and we'll make exceptions. I understood that. You have to explain these things in such detail to liberals. And then when he comes out with, what we'll do is ban them from Muslim terrorism producing countries. Right. Yeah, that's kind of what I figured he meant. Yeah, so Mal Mal I didn't Malaysia mean fine. That level Saudi of detail. Right. <laughs> so we're almost out of time. But last question has, has Trump read this book? And if so, do you think he agrees with it? Um, there were a few things that I thought he might not like, but I think he'll understand that. What I'll, do you think he won't like? The Great Orange Hope. <laughs> and I do have to point out that he's coarse and tasteless. He probably isn't wild about that, but it's to praise him. And I think he will understand, he is smart and he does understand marketing, that a lot of this, I mean, some of it is written, obviously, for Trump fans to give them backup, but also it's written for the never Trumpers, because mostly what I hear from them, and including an attack on my erstwhile hero, Charles Murray. <laughs> Did you get to that yet? Yeah. <laughs> um, because I've really been appalled at a lot of our the intellectuals on our side that... Yeah, why they are the ones who are the superficial snobs americans are voting on issues and they're voting on the gold fixtures okay fine i don't like the trophy wives and and you know the tacky gold filigree either can we get beyond that he's gonna <laughs> build a wall <laughs> and coulter ladies and gentlemen the book in trump we trust e pluribus awesome it was great thank you thank you good to see you